Good morning, Bristol. How are we all today? Well, 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 that's the last bit of audience participation I'm going to ask of you, so you can all relax. So I'm Torty. I'm in my third year of a PhD, thank goodness, and uh, I'm supervised by Peter Flack, uh, who's unfortunately can't be with us today, so you are stuck with me, I'm afraid. So let's all think of a time when technology has let us down, whether that be on our phones, like these Siri examples here, or on our laptops, when those stupid things just won't turn on. And unfortunately for you lot, I'm not here today to tell you that those problems are going away anytime soon. What I am going to do is talk to you about how AI sometimes fails and how explainable AI as a research discipline is helping us understand why that happens. So, my first memory of AI was when my dad sat me down to watch the Terminator at the ripe old age of eight. And since then, I've noticed a common theme with AI and film, and that is that they are always evil, always really smart, and always out to destroy humanity in some stupid way. Unless, of course, you're Wally, everyone's favorite robot, who is, of course, exempt from this roasting. But what about AI in reality? What's happening here? Over the last 10 years, we've sort of seen a worrying association with AI and racist, sexist, generally discriminative behavior. So is AI really as evil as these headlines would make it appear? And if so, then why are we still using it? So to answer this, let's tap into a bit more what AI really is. It's notoriously hard to define. It, but it was first introduced as a field, a workshop at Dartmouth College in the 1950s when a group of researchers got together and thought that in one weekend they could entirely capture humanity, human intelligence in a machine. This obviously failed and since then we've come through leaps and bounds and in the 90s, led by the development of machine learning, AI sort of had a rebranding, a resurgence. And today machine learning is the power horse of AI where it learns from data, it extracts knowledge from that data, and predicts the future using that knowledge. And today, the sort of the sexy part of machine learning is really deep learning. And you hear this used all the time, where deep learning is a class of machine learning models inspired by the neurons in the human brain. When I first heard about deep learning, I thought it was a bit of magic. Uh, but it's not magic, it's uh, just maths. I don't know what that means for all of you. Um, so as a class of machine learning models, deep learning predicts the future. So it predicts um, on unseen events. And in this case, we're predicting from unseen images of cats and dogs. Now, deep learning models, they um, replicate the human's ability to learn from examples, which is why we always feed in a huge number of examples, in this case, a huge number of images of cats and dogs. So let's do that. So, Imagine splitting the human brain right down the middle, laying it flat, and that's what our deep learning networks start to look like, as a collection of these neurons or nodes and all the connections between those. Now what that deep learning network does is it learns the differences and the similarities um, between those examples so we can differentiate between cats and dogs. Now the real power of deep learning comes from the complexity in that network. So as we increase the dimensionality of those nodes and the connections, what we find is that deep learning, the number of similarities and differences that network can learn far exceeds the capacity of the human brain, which is why they're so good at what they do. And more recently, as we get more and more complex networks, they start to resemble more and more the human brain. And like, I have no idea what's coming on in that. And that's a recent architecture from GraphCore. But that's where we get this phrase, the black box from because we accept that these things are so complicated, but they are really good at doing what they do. So, how do we get from a really good pattern recognition system, albeit very complex one, to a discriminative system? Well, the answer that, I don't know, will this surprise you? It's, uh, it's us, unfortunately. So AI is really good at recognizing whether there's a dog or a cat in an image. What it's not very good at is understanding beyond that collection of pixels what a cat or a dog really is, what a human really is. 
So that sort of like, that lack of ground truth of general knowledge makes an AI really dumb in that way. So again, they're very good at doing what we tell them to do, but humans are actually really bad at telling an AI what it is we want it to do. So to see that, let's take our lovely black box again and train it with some pictures of dogs and cats. Lovely. Now we get it to predict what those two unseen images are, and that's all tickety-boo, cat and dog, as we're expecting. However, we feed it in this lovely image of a golden lab there, and oh dear, I mean, that is clearly not a cat. So to see why that's happening, why has that AI got that wrong? If we look at all those pictures of cats that are taken in the garden, and all those pictures of dogs are taken inside. So when we give our black box a picture of a dog in the garden, it gets the wrong answer. So actually, our black box has done what we've asked it to do. It's learned the similarities and differences between those examples, but that's not actually what we wanted it to do. We wanted it to learn what the objects are in the foreground. And this can be really catastrophic when we're applying it in practice. So let's have a look at this example here. We've got this, uh, this interesting bank there on the right, and they want to start using AI to help them determine whether to grant people loans or deny them loans. So they train their black box model on historical data of people being granted or denied their loan. And then they get two new customers coming in, Alice and Bob, where Alice gets denied a loan and Bob gets granted a loan. Now, <laughs> there are obviously loads of ethical implications of using a black box in a system like this. But the one I'm talking about today is the fact that that black box is so complex, we have no idea what parts of the features of the input it's using to make a decision. So basically, yep, yeah, so we can't give any justification to Alice or Bob um, as to why they have been granted or denied a loan. And that's really problematic, right? That's why we're seeing all these sort of misapplied black box models in practice that have all these serious consequences for the people um, they're, they're given to. And that is where explainable AI comes into its own. So it's a research discipline, a fairly new one, which is trying to unpick the reasons for giving a certain prediction uh, to a certain person. And it's helping us understand what exactly is happening in that black box. It's a really uh, exciting but growing field, and there are lots of different approaches, and I'm not gonna attempt to cover them today, but I am gonna talk about two of them. So the first one is to say, actually, I'm really not comfortable with using this complex model, so let's just sack off the box. Let's get rid of it and replace it with an interpretable model, which could be a linear model like this, where we encode all our historical data as samples, and then those uh, red samples indicate people who have been gran uh, granted a loan, and those yellow samples indicate people who have been denied a loan, and we can learn a linear separator between those classes, which we can then encode as an equation Oh, only a bit of maths here, I promise. Um, where our loan approved our outcome is dependent on our feature values weighted by these coefficients, which we can interpret as our feature importances. And this is great because we can sort of see here exactly what the model is doing, and that all seems pretty ideal. But the problem is we can't replace all our black boxes with these linear models. We need those um, in some cases which is why we have these other approaches which accept those black boxes as they are and say, okay, let's probe those. Can we explain them anyway? So these work by taking a black box and an instance we want to be explained and her associated feature values. So this is Alice being denied her loan. And what these methods do is they give an explanation in terms of those feature values. So they slightly modify all those feature values to create thousands and thousands of hypothetical Alice's. We can then get the black box prediction on those hypothetical Alice's and approximate the behavior of that black box model with a linear model, which is like the one we saw before on the last slide, which, as we saw before, we can get those coefficients out and use them for our feature importances. So Alice gets some sort of justification for why she was denied the loan. Now, these are really popular in practice, so I really suggest you check these out if you're interested in explaining your black box. But, and there always is a but. Explainable AI is such an early field. It's got a lot of problems with it before, and we need to iron those out before we can apply it in practice. And that's where my PhD comes in. That's what I do. And I focus on looking at the problems with explainable AI um, 
when we apply it to different data types. So a building block of uh, explainability approaches is the, the ability to decompose that input into interpretable concepts. So for Alice, that looks like things like age, gender, income, credit score, her features, which are semantically meaningful for a human. But when we look at images and time series, for a black box, that, um, that image is just a large collection of pixel values. So we need to find a way of grouping those pixel values into these meaningful concepts which we can offer to an end user as an explanation. And this is actually quite good for images because we have a collection of sort of visual features which we can use, so things like ears, eyes, whiskers. But for a time series, that's even more complex because there's no obvious semantic conceptualization in the same way there is for images. The second is the ability to slightly modify those feature values to create those sort of hypothetical analysis, which again, for images and time series, this is really non-trivial. The common practice is to sort of replace those features with sort of a constant value, so sort of whiting out a region, as you can see there with the image. But the point of this is to sort of maintain the realism of the resulting hypothetical image or the hypothetical time series. And you can see right away that that sort of white region completely changes the context of the image. So I've done this, and this is sort of my PhD, and I find it really interesting. And if you do too, you can check out a paper that I recently wrote with my supervisor. But to sum up, we've had a look at how AI sometimes fails and how explainability helps us understand why that happens. As machine learning models grow more and more complex, our ability to correctly sort of specify those models is only going to decrease. We're only going to get worse at that. So explainable AI is going to be really important, especially as we're hurtling towards this world where humans are going to be able to answer back with us. They're going to be able to communicate with us. So I'm hoping for a world where those AI systems will be able to tell us what's wrong with the models before we're even aware of the problem. But I think that's pretty utopian, so let's all cross our fingers for that. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I'm in toy. Thank you very much, Torti. I should have said at the beginning, so Torti's PhD is funded by the Alan Turing Institute, and I know we've got some colleagues in the room from there, so it's a really great example of how... The Alan Turing Institute is the National Institute for Data Science and AI. Um, uh, the University of Bristol is one of 13 university partners and one of the programs they, ha they have had in the past is, is funding PhD students um, and it's a really great way I think I really wanted to, to kick off the event today by supporting the work of an early career researcher as well and we, which I'm not sure she's quite off the hook yet because we do have a few minutes for questions so if anyone's got a question for Torti um, do we have a roving mic? can we have a roving mic? yeah thank you we've got a question at the back Hi, I'd like to talk. Can I be cheeky and ask two questions? Um, the first is, how, how, how do you feel your uh, research relates to the data-centric AI that Andrew Nung's talking about? Because you're basically, you know, it's a, th it's a bit retro, sort of doing feature engineering. I mean, you're doing the right thing, you're doing feature engineering. And the second one is, um, why wouldn't you use a random forest? Because that just gives you feature importance and... Um, so, I mean, I know neural networks are the sort of the buzz thing, but, you know, there are, they're not always the right thing to use. Fantastic questions. Thank you. Love that. Um, <laughs> really put me on the spot. So, to answer your first question, that and this sort of insinuation that explainability is sort of old school, because I guess you're right, it is just feature engineering. And the examples I gave you are particular explainability metrics that are feature engineering, but there are so many different types. Um, and also the ability to sort of tag these um, measures on post hoc to any model, any application, and get some sort of feature evaluation out of that is really important. And so that's your second question about why not use a random forest? Big random forest guy. <laughs> no, it's, you can't, you, the point is, is that we're never going to get to a future where one model is the default model. Sure. Random forests come with a whole set of assumptions, a whole set of limitations. Yeah, yeah, so that yes, you may be able to get feature importance out of them, yeah. but um, there's a lot of things to consider there. And, and these are great, these, these metrics, because you can just tag them onto any model. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, we've got another one here. Thanks, Kiara. 
Thank you. That was very interesting. Maybe another unfair question, but as a lawyer, the issue is you want fe some features not to be used. So we start regulating that, and then you're going to start seeing cats that only have noses because we have so many things you don't want to look. So, so how do you see that going forward? Because it's just a difficult balance between saying some features just are, are off the game, but we still want it to be good at what it does. That's really interesting because there's a whole problem when you start removing features from models in the first place because you say, okay, if I don't want to use things like race or gender in a model, then that's going to be a fair model, right? But the problem is, is those features are so heavily correlated with so many other features we see. So you can't just remove those. That's not a, a long-term solution to that problem. Um, you've got to find a way, and there are lots of methods that do this that sort of work in those fairness principles in those models. Time for one more, I think, before a quick break. Yep, it's front here. When you ask a human for an explanation, you can have a dialogue with them. Is there anything like that with, uh, with an AI? I think we're getting there. It, it's, there are, we're seeing a lot more research where you're looking at that, that two-way street, right? Especially if you're thinking of settings like clinicians in healthcare, where an AI may give an answer and you might want more queries and more explanation and really probe that explanation. And we are getting those in those sort of decision support systems. But that's a really fascinating part of research. And I think that's sort of the crux of future explainability is how do we get that human-computer interaction out. Thank you. Another question, sorry, one more. <laughs> question at the front. Um, your talk was brilliant, thank you. Um, I uh, just wanted to get your opinion. There are some people who um, think that you shouldn't use AI if it can't be explained, um, whereas other people who think that actually predictive power is the only thing that matters. Where do you stand on, on losing predictive power in order to get explainability? That's a really interesting personal question. Uh, <laughs> it translates to all counts of my life. Um, I think that, what do I think? I think that you can't have everything, but you can, you can be very clear about what it is you're prioritizing. I think you're always going to make, have to make a decision over whether you're prioritizing interpretability or accuracy, and you choose your model accordingly. But as long as you're transparent about your set of assumptions and what you're choosing, then I think... That's maybe the best. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, I think the, the level of, of interest in the room is a is kind of indication of, of, of how exciting the work that Torti and others are doing in this space. So round of applause for Torti. Thank you very much. <laughs>